Hey, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. My name is Shane Fuller, and I'm one of the associate campus pastors here in Cedar Falls. And I just want to say I am really excited to have the opportunity to spend time with you this weekend because, did you know, we are approaching the end of not just a year, but a decade a decade, and I have only experienced a few of those in my life, so as we've approached the end of this one, it's got me thinking about these last 10 years of my life, and what it's been like, some of the experiences I've had, and so I put together a few photos so I could bring you guys along on the journey, okay? So let's start with 10 years ago, while I was at college at UNI, I went to a concert with some of my roommates and friends. You see the guy in the white shirt on top of everybody's heads? That's me. <laughs> That's me. Okay, so that brings us to the next thing that happened, which was me graduating from University of Northern Iowa. <laughs> so that was my then fiance, Bryn. Uh, the next thing that happened was Bryn and I got married. There it is, the day that I tricked her into spending the rest of her life with me. Next thing that happened was the two of us moved down to Phoenix. So, no, not that one, change that one, quick, quick. Yeah, there you go, there you go. The one where Bryn and I moved to Phoenix so I could start seminary. Uh, and while we were there, a couple years after being married, we got pregnant with our first, um, our daughter, Haddon. There she is in all her glory. Uh, after being uh, in seminary for a little while and recently after Haddon was born, my grandpa Mort passed away. So that's a picture of me with grandpa uh, in his last week before he passed. Uh, shortly after that, I was able to finish my degree and I actually graduated from seminary, which was a great time. Uh, however, it was this weekend that I realized all of the stomach problems and chest pains that I had been dealing with for a couple of years prior to that. I wasn't actually having any medical problems. I was having anxiety attacks. So that wasn't so awesome, right? <laughs> uh, the next thing that happened was we had our second, Kuiper, and around the same time, we got to celebrate me being 10 years cancer-free. 10 years cancer-free. Yeah, thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, then after that, uh, we had our third. His name is Brock. Oh, Easter, I forgot about Easter. How could I forget? Picture perfect, am I right? I'm sure all of you had photos like that on Instagram. Uh, that was our Easter morning one year. After that, we had our son Brock, there he is. He and I doing what both of us do best. And that kind of brings us to uh, the end of the decade, just a couple of photos of my family and me now, uh, so you get to see sort of my decade in review. So there you go. I'm glad I could bring you along the journey of my decade, uh, but hey, I think that's plenty about me. For this part of our service, you're going to need a couple of things, all right? So the first one is a Bible. So at your campus, somewhere around you, there is a Bible um, in a chair or in a pew, wherever you're at. If you can't reach one from where you are, just elbow someone next to you and they will get one for you. Uh, at Prairie Lakes Church, we're also uh, incredibly open to you getting your phone out and using a Bible app on your phone or your tablet or whatever you've got with you. So uh, everybody try to get one of those in their hands. The other thing that you might want is a pen. Uh, again, at your campuses, some of you have pens in the seats around you, but others of you are going to have some ushers who come down right now. So ushers, if you would, you can make your way around with some pens if you want one. All you got to do is get your hand up and an usher will get a pen to you, all right? So Bibles and pens. Um, the end of a year always provides us with a chance to look back, to reflect on what's happened the past 12 months. But as I pointed out already, we're at the end of a decade, and so instead of looking back at the last 12 months, we're going to take some time this weekend to look back at the last 10 years, the end of a decade. And I'm confident that you'll see you as our time goes on together, that looking back is well worth it. But if we're honest, if you're honest, and if I'm honest, most of us would probably admit looking back isn't really something we like doing, is it? In fact, here's some of the most common ways that we tend to treat our past, okay? So some common ways we tend to treat our past. Number one, is we run away from it. We run away from it. Most of us probably don't even know why we're running. We're just running. It's the gut reaction that almost all of us have. Like, I definitely want to run away from some of the pictures that I showed you from my decade. A lot of you would probably want to run away from some of your 10, 20, 30-year-old photos, am I right? Sometimes 
running away from our past comes from a deep spot of shame that we're carrying around. I couldn't tell you the amount of times that I sit and talk to people who are deeply ashamed of their past. They feel like there's no way they can be free from the person they were or the things that they did. Others are trying to run away from the consequences of their actions, whether it be with their finances, with their relationships, with their families, or with their career mistakes. Running away from our past is one way that we treat it. Another common way we treat our past is to just get stuck in it. We just get stuck in our past. Instead of running away, we just stayed there all these years. And all of us, I would imagine, know someone who just can't stop talking about their high school sports. All of us know somebody, someone who does that, don't we? The guy who's like, hey, that one time I did that great thing with the great team and the great game and they cheered for that great crowd. All of us know somebody like that. You also probably know the girl who can't stop talking about the boyfriend who left her high and dry. Or maybe the parent who keeps trying to live like they haven't had kids yet, even though they've had them for five or six years. And maybe it's more tragic than that. Maybe it's the memories of a lost loved one or of a traumatic childhood. Some of us just get stuck in our past. The last kind of common way we treat our past is to wish we could just get it back. It's all we want is to just get it back. Wish we could get the past back. And if we're honest, I think all of us catch ourselves from time to time thinking about the good old days, whatever those happen to mean to you. This is one of the biggest reasons why the new app, Disney Plus, is having so much success. There's a bunch of 20 and 30 year olds re-watching their junior high and high school Disney shows and movies. They maybe didn't even realize they wanted to get their past back, but once Disney Plus dangled it in front of them, all of a sudden they wanted to watch High School Musical again. Maybe the thing you miss is when you could eat as much as you wanted without gaining weight. Or maybe life before the divorce. Or life before the diagnosis. Maybe you wish you could get back a time where your kids didn't wake you up at 6 a.m. every morning. Or maybe you wish you could go back to the time before your teenager thought they knew more than you do. Those are far and away the three most common ways that we treat our past. It's what almost all of us do from one time to another. But those aren't our only options. And I want to tell you about another way to treat our past this weekend. And so to do that, we need to look to another group of people, a group of people who lived way before this decade, I want to take a look back to the first century Jews. See, the Jews in the time of Jesus, they thought about their past a lot differently than we do. They thought of their past as a mentor, something to learn from, something to guide them through their present and into their future. Jews in the first century, they walked forward, backward, looking at their past letting it inform their present, pointing them to, to their future. They walked forward, backward. First century Jews knew the best thing to do with their past wasn't to run away from it. It wasn't to get stuck in it or to wish that it hadn't existed or that they could go back to it. Rather, they knew all of their past, all of it, was valuable because it could teach them what to do now and what they should probably do in the future. And the Jews, they learned this because the history of Israel was a history of looking back. If you read now through your Old Testament, you'll be hard pressed to read very long without finding a reference to someone trying to point you back to the past. Old Testament authors and prophets, they were constantly trying to get people to remember what had happened in their past. God was always trying to remind his people of what had happened in their past. Some of you might remember the story of the Exodus when God freed Israel from slavery in Egypt. Well, in the Old Testament alone, there are 87 times that God says to his people, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. 87 times. So I'm pretty sure God wanted them to learn something in their present and coming up in their future from what had happened in their past being freed from Egypt. And if he wanted them to do it, I'm pretty sure he wants us to learn from it too, doesn't he? 
New Testament authors, they got in on this action too. Over and over again, they write to the first Christian churches to not forget what God has done for his people. To not forget what the people of old behaved like. What they did do that they should follow the example of or what they did do that they shouldn't follow the example of. So this weekend, we're going to do what the first century Jews did. We're going to walk forward, backward. We're going to walk forward, backward. We're going to learn from our most recent decade. Let's be humble enough to see these past 10 years of our lives as a mentor rather than something to escape from. Because, because when we look back, sins look further, God's mercy is clearer, and Jesus proves greater. We're going to look back because when we look back, sins look further, God's mercy is clearer, and Jesus proves greater. That's why we're going to look back. Okay, you've got your Bibles, you've got your phone out with your Bible app open, so everybody get those out. Uh, We are going to turn together to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 1 through 7 this weekend. And as you go ahead and get there, I just want to remind you that if you aren't very familiar with your Bible, that is completely okay. In fact, we expect that a lot of you probably wouldn't be. And so if you have a hard copy of your Bible, there's a table of contents for a reason. Feel free to look at it. No one's going to judge you. No one's watching you or paying attention to what you're doing and how you're trying to find Ephesians. If you've got your phone, same deal. There's a table of contents on there, right? So I don't care how you get to Ephesians, just get to Ephesians 2. And while you do, I want to give you some context for what we're going to be reading. Uh, Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians. Paul was, the best way to describe it is he was a uh, missionary church planner, and one of the churches that he helped get started was in Ephesus, so hence the letter to the Ephesians. And as chapter 1 comes to an end, Paul has just discussed how Jesus is in authority over all things, especially the church. Then he turns his attention to the Ephesian believers, the group of people he's writing to. And he starts by reminding them of who they used to be. He wants to remind them who they used to be. In other words, Paul wants them to look back at their past. He wants them to walk forward, backward. Because remember, when we look back, sins look farther, God's mercy is clearer, and Jesus proves greater. All right, so let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Paul says, As for you, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. When we look back, sins look further. When we look back, sins look further. See what Paul's saying to the Ephesians? Hey, don't forget. Back then, you guys were dead in your transgressions and sins. Which Pastor Jesse helped me out a week ago as he uh, taught us what transgressions and what sins are meant here in Ephesians. So transgressions are the things we knew were wrong, but we did anyways. And sins, they were every other way that we fall short of who we ought to be and what we ought to do. Paul tells the Ephesians, just like he tells us this weekend, look back. Remember how you used to live? Remember the ways you used to be dead in your trespasses and sins? Remember how you're not those things anymore? We should celebrate that. See, Paul, he wants the Ephesians to let their past mentor them. He doesn't want them to run away from it. He wants them to keep on remembering it. One of the best ways that we can combat falling back into old sins or into destructive habits is to continue remembering where we've been, where we've come from, and how we've changed. 
But unfortunately, again, for us, most of us just don't want to look back. Most of us don't want to look back. We, won't, we don't want to see the sins that we used to live in. So we don't get a chance to appreciate how far they seem now. Instead, we just feel ashamed of where we've been. There's this great little book that if you haven't uh, read it, I would encourage you to. It's called The Cross-Centered Life. It's just a little book that'd be worth your time. Uh, and in it, the author discusses something similar to what we're talking about this weekend. Uh, he recounts how he grew up as a teenager in Washington, D.C., and as a teen, he fell into a life of drug abuse. And when he and his friends would kind of pick the drug of the day, they would end up uh, heading to one of the monuments. They'd always pick the same one. They'd head to it late at night, and they would sit and then fall asleep on the steps of the monument to come down from their high. And in the book, he then tells that in his adulthood later on in life, he steps over the faith line and becomes a Christian. And now if you're new around here at Prairie Lakes Church, you're going to hear us talk about the faith line a lot. And here's what it means. Just like Paul said, at some point, all of us stand dead in our transgressions and sins. All of us stand on this side of the faith line. And then at some point, our eyes are awakened with faith to who Jesus is and what he's done for us on our behalf. And as we see him and what he's done, we're able to put our faith in him. We're able to step over the line of faith. And as we do, we become in right relationship with God so that we can love and obey Jesus for the rest of our lives. Okay, so that's the faith line. And this author, he stepped over it and he became a Christian. And in his adulthood, he was given the chance right, to leave the city that he abused drugs in, to never go by the monument that would remind him of his past. But instead, when most of us would have looked away or never driven by those monuments again or just moved out of the city all, all, all completely, instead, he would drive by it and he would look and he would remember. He would remember the life he used to live. He would remember the plight of his lifestyle. He would remember how the path he was walking down was one that led to destruction. And because of his remembering, he would realize, I'm not that person anymore. I've changed. I've been made new. I've been given a new chance. His sins looked further away now than they ever would have if he hadn't just looked. And Paul wants the same for us. He doesn't want us to forget our past. He wants us to look back at this past decade and say, man, look how far I've come from some of the sins that I used to struggle with. Look how far those sins seem now. Look how long it's been since I yelled at my wife in anger. Look how long it's been since I gossiped with my coworkers. Look how long it's been since I was too proud to ask anybody for help. Look how long it's been since I selfishly chose work over my kids. Look how long it's been since I've watched pornography. Look how long it's been since I lied to my spouse about our finances. Look how long it's been since I spent day after day comparing myself to everybody else on Instagram. Look how long it's been since I found my security in my bank account. Look how long it has been. And pretty soon in just a few days, we're going to have the ability to say something like this. I haven't done that since last decade. I haven't done that since last decade. I haven't used the divorce word in an argument with my spouse since last decade. I haven't clicked on those links since last decade. I haven't taken the frustrations of work out on my family since last decade. When we're living life with Jesus, when we've stepped over the faith line, we can look back and see that our sins look further. Does this mean we won't struggle with any sins next decade? Of course not. Hopefully, though, we can continue to walk forward, backward, and see how the sins we used to struggle with seem less appealing now, and the ones that we battle with in this decade don't win as often as they did in the last one. So what else happens when we look back? Well, when we look back, not only do sins look further, but God's mercy is clearer. God's mercy is clearer. All of us have been through difficult things this past decade. Some of us have been through some awesome things this past decade. No decade comes 
without peaks and valleys. Whether it's been a great decade for you, a heartbreaking decade for you, or somewhere in between, Ephesians 2 beckons us, look back and see God's mercy more clearly now than you could have then. God says that because of our transgressions and sin, we gratified our sinful nature. And like the rest, we were objects of wrath. But, but, because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. Have you, have you ever been through something so difficult that while you experience, you ask things like, where's God at now? What's he doing? Why is he putting me through this? If he loved me, wouldn't he change the circumstance or take it away from me? How come he hasn't fixed this yet? How could I ever move on from the pain I find myself in today? Well, if you have, and I'm guessing that's most of us, then you also know there have been times in your life where you've been able to walk forward, backward, and you've been able to see God's mercy more clearly where you stand today than you ever imagined you'd have been able to back then. I remember a few years back, I was doing a funeral service for one of my friend's newborn sons. His name was Elijah. It was awful. But my friend's faith and trust in God during that time inspired me. And even though they were inspiring to me, I still remember saying to God, what are you doing? Why this? Why them? Those friends continued to remind me that we would see God's mercy through this eventually. And well, eventually, they started leading a small group and they filled up their group and they found out on the first night that it just so happened that the rest of the couples in the group had also experienced infant loss of some kind. My friends that night began to see God's mercy taking shape. And not much longer after that, another one of my friends had a son diagnosed with something really similar to Elijah. That son, Matthew, he lived 33, year, 33 hours before going to be with Jesus. And again, in the moments, I was left asking, God, what are you doing? How could this happen? Why them? Why him? How are you going to use this one? Guess who the first people to show up for Matthew's parents were? Elijah's parents. And lo and behold, Matthew's parents almost immediately began to see God's mercy through their pain. Dozens, dozens of people are now regularly attending church because of Matthew's story. Dozens of people have heard about God's kindness and his mercies because of Matthew's story. Dozens of people have drawn near to God because of Matthew's story. Even in the worst of circumstances, once you're given some time to look back, God's mercy always shows through. And does it make everything better? No. Does it answer or take away all the questions? No. But if we would just allow the past to be our mentor, we could trust that the next time we go through something incredibly difficult, we could trust that we would eventually see God's mercy. He hasn't left because he didn't leave us last time. He's not going anywhere because he never did before. He hasn't forgotten us because he didn't back then. He does care because he showed us he did last time. And he does love us because he already proved it. When we look back, both at the good and at the bad, we can see how God turns objects of wrath like you and me into new creations who, though we suffer and though we hurt, can trust that God's mercy will shine through. So walk forward, backward, and you will see, we will see God's mercy more clearly. What else happens when we look back? Sins look further, God's mercy is clearer, and mm, Jesus proves greater. Jesus proves greater. Let's look back at our passage in Ephesians 2 at verse 6. 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has been kind to us in Jesus. So kind, in fact, that Paul says that kindness is incomparable. When we walk forward, backward, Jesus proves greater. There's a lot that we can celebrate from this past decade. I mean, let's just think about Prayer Lakes Church as an example. A decade ago, we had one church in Cedar Falls. Now, a decade later, there's multiple churches all over the state, and we just had 6,000 people attend Christmas Eve services across Prairie Lakes Church and across the state of Iowa. There's a lot to celebrate. This decade also gave us Uber. It gave us Instagram and Spotify. And don't forget, it gave us three LeBron James NBA titles. <laughs> Tons of us across all our campuses. We've gotten married. We've had kids. We've secured great jobs. We've taken awesome vacations. But in all these things, Jesus proves greater. He's the one who makes dead things like you and me alive. And that's something LeBron and Spotify and Uber could never do. What else proved itself great to you this past decade? You worked hard, you read some books and got some promotions. Jesus is greater. You lost 20 pounds and you actually kept it off. Jesus is greater. You finally hit the million dollar mark in your retirement funds. Jesus is greater. Hey, there's a lot we wish hadn't happened this past decade too. In Iowa, we had floods and tornadoes, tragedies, our nations in a political toilet bowl. And it seems like we're a lot farther apart than we've been in a while. Some of us didn't get the awesome job, we lost it lost our marriage, lost our dignity, and lost our loved ones too. But in all of these things, Jesus again proves greater. Jesus is the one who says, I know it hurts, I feel it too. Jesus is the one who says, I've lost my friends and my family, and I cried a lot too. Jesus is the one who says, I know, daughter, and I'm not going to leave. So whether you see joy or whether you see pain, as you look back at your past decade, I know one thing is for sure. Jesus is greater than whatever you see. He's brighter than the joys, and he lights up the shadows too. Paul was certain when he wrote Ephesians 2, and I'm certain as we read it together this weekend, that God's kindness to you and Jesus is going to prove greater over and over and over again, even when you add up all the decades that you're going to live through. Jesus is greater. So, Prairie Lakes Church, as we conclude a decade together, let's do what those who came before us did. Let's walk forward, backward. Because when we look back, sins look further God's mercy is clearer and Jesus proves greater. Hey, let's pray together. God, you, uh, you've been kind to us. You're in the business of making dead things alive and God, we, this weekend, are no exception. God, because of you, we can look at all the good and all the bad from these past 10 years and we can learn we can be mentored, and we can be helped. God, you proved yourself once again this decade, and you're going to prove yourself again in the next one. But God, we need your help to fight our sin, to see your mercy, and to really see Jesus for who he is. And God, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.